Hi, welcome to the video. I'm going to take you through a few different indexes in FISE today, so FISE for similarity search, and we're going to learn how we can decide which index to use based on our data. Now, these indexes are reasonably complex, but we're going to just have a sort of high level look at each one of them. At some point in the future, we'll go into more depth for sure, but for now, this is what we're going to do. So we're going to cover the indexes that you see on the screen at the moment. So we have the flat indexes, which are just the plain and simple, uh, nothing special going on there. And then we're going to have a look at LSH or locality sensitive hashing, HNSW, which is hierarchical navigable small worlds. And then finally, we're going to have a look at an IVF index as well. So first thing I'm gonna show you is how to get some data for following through this. So we're going to be using the SIFT1M data set, which is 1 million vectors that we can use for testing similarity. Now there's a little bit of code, so I'm just going to show it to you. So we have here, we're just downloading the code. Um, there'll be a, a notebook for this in the description as well, so you can just use that and, and copy things across. Uh, but we're downloading it from here and this will give us a, a tar file so we download that and then here all we're doing is extracting all the files from inside the tar file and then here i'm reading everything into the notebook so inside that tar file we'll get these fvex files and we have to open them in a, a certain way which is what we're doing here so we're setting up the, the function to read them, sorry, here. And then here I'm reading in two files. So we get a few different files here. So I'm sorry, this should be sift. So we get the base data, which is going to be the data that we're going to search through. And then we also have query data here. And then what I'm doing here is just selecting a single query a single vector to query with rather than all of them because we get quite a few in there. And then here we can just see, so this is our query vector, the XQ, and then we also have WB here, which is going to be the data that will index and search through, and we can see some of it there as well. So that's how we get data. Let's move on to some flat indexes. So what you can see at the moment is a sort of a visual representation of a flat L2 index. Now, up here, this is what we're doing. So we're calculating, we have all these points. So these are all of the WB points that we saw before, and this is our query vector. And we just calculate the distance between all of those. And then what we do is just take the top three. So the top K in reality, but in this case, it's top three. Now, we also have IP, so we have both L2 distance and IP distance as well. IP works in a different way. So we're using a different formula to actually calculate the distance or similarity there. So it's not exactly as you as you see it here. But before we write any code, I just want to say that with flat indexes, they are you know 100 percent quality. And typically what we want to do with FICE and similarity search indexes is balance the search quality versus the search speed. Higher search quality, usually slower search speed. And flat indexes are just pure search quality because they are an exhaustive search. So they check the distance between your query vector and every other vector in the index, which is fine if you don't have a particularly big data set or you don't care about time, but if you do, then you probably don't want to use that because it can take an incredibly long time. If you have a billion vectors in your data set and you do 100 queries a minute, then you, as far as I know, it's it's impossible to, to run that. And if you were going to run that, you'd need some pretty insane hardware. So we can't use flat indexes and exhaustive search in most cases. But I will show you how to do it. So first, I'm just going to define dimensionality of our data, which is 128, which we can see up here, 128. I'm also going to say how many, so how many results do we want to return? I'm going to say 10. 
okay? We also need to import files before we do anything. And then we can initialize our index. So I said we have two. So we have files index flat L2 or IP. I'm going to use IP because it's very slightly faster. It seems from me testing it, it very slightly faster, but there's hardly any difference in reality. So that initializes our index and then we want to add our data to it. So we add WB and then we perform a search. So let me create a new cell and let me just run this quickly. Okay. And what I'm going to do is just time it so you can see how long this takes as well. So I'm going to do time and we're going to do index or sorry, di equals index search. And then in here we have our query vector and how many samples we'd like to return. So I'm going to go with k. Okay, so that was reasonably quick and that's because we're not we don't have a huge data set and we're just searching for one query. So it's not really too much of a problem there. But what I do want to show you is, so if we print out I, that returns all of the IDs or the indexes of the 10 most similar vectors. Now, I'm going to use that as a baseline for each of our other indexes. So this is, like I said, 100% quality and we can use this accuracy to test out other indexes as well. So what I'm going to do is take that and convert it into a list. And if we just have a look at what we get, we see that we get a list like that. And we're just going to use that, like I said, to see how our other indexes are performing. So we'll move on to the other indexes. And like I said before, we want to try and go from this, which is the flat indexes, where it's just 100% search quality to something that's more 50-50. Uh, but it depends on our use case as well. Sometimes we might want more speed, sometimes higher quality. So we will see a few of those through these indexes. So we start with LSH. So a very high level. LSH works by grouping vectors into different buckets. Now, what we can see on the screen now is a typical hashing function for like a Python dictionary. And what these hashing functions do is they try to minimize collisions. So a collision is where we would have the case of two items, maybe say these two, um, being hashed into the same bucket. And we, with a dictionary, you don't want that because you want every bucket to be an independent value. Otherwise, it increases the complexity of extracting your values from a single bucket if they've collided. Now, LSH is slightly different because we actually do want to group things. So we can see it as a, as a dictionary, but rather than, whereas before we were avoiding those collisions, you can see here we're you know, putting them into completely different buckets every time. Rather than doing that, we're trying to maximize collisions. So we can see here that we've pushed all three of these keys into this single bucket here. And we've also pushed all of these keys into this single bucket. So we get groupings of our values. Now, when it comes to performing our search, we perform, we process our query through the same hashing function, and that will push it to one of our buckets. Now, in the case of maybe appearing in this bucket here, we use Hamming distance to find the nearest bucket, and then we can search or we restrict our scope to these values. So we just restricted our scope there, which means that we do not need to search through everything. So we are avoiding searching through those values down there. Now let's have a look at how we implement that. So it's pretty straightforward. All we do is index, we do vice index LSH. We have our dimensionality. And then we also have this other variable, which is called n bits. So I will put that in a variable up here do n bits and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it uh, d multiplied by 4. So n bits we will have to scale with the dimensionality of our data which comes into another problem which I'll mention later on which is the cursive dimensionality but I'll talk more about it 
in a moment. So here we have n bits, and then we add our data like we did before, and then we can search our data just like we did before. So we do time, and we do we want d i equals index search, and we are searching using our query, our search query, and we want to return 10 items. Okay, so quicker speed, see here. And what we can also do is compare the results to our 100% quality index or flat index. And we do that using numpy in 1D baseline i. Okay, so I'm just going to look at it visually here. So we can see we have quite a lot of matches. So plenty of trues, a couple of falses, true, false, false, false. So these are the top 10 that have been returned using our LSH algorithm. And we're checking if they exist in the baseline results that we got from our flat index earlier. And we're returning that most of them are present in that baseline. So most of them do match. So it's you know reasonably good recall there. So that's good. And it was faster. So we've got 17.6 milliseconds here. How much did we get up here? We got 157 milliseconds. So slightly less accurate, but what is that 10 times faster? So it's, it's pretty good. And we can mess around with n bits. We can increase it to increase the accuracy of our index or we decrease it to increase the speed. So again, it's just trying to balance, find that balance between them both. Okay, so this is a graph just showing you the, uh, the recall so with different n bit values. So as we sort of saw before, we increase the n bits value for good recall, but at the same time we have that curse of dimensionality. So if we are multiplying our dimensionality value D by eight in order to get a good recall, then if we have a dimensionality of four, that's not a very high number, so it's gonna be reasonably fast. But if we increase that to a dimensionality, of, for example, 512, that becomes very, very complex very quickly. So you have to be careful with your dimensionality. Lower dimensionality is very good for LSH, otherwise it's not so good. You can see that here. So. At the bottom here, I've used, this is on the same data set. So an n bits value of D multiplied by two. The With LSH, it's super fast. It's faster than our flat index, which is you know what you would hope. But if we increase the n bits value quite a bit, so maybe you want very high performance, then it gets out of hand very quickly in our search time it just grows massively. So you kind of have to find that balance. Uh, but what we got before was pretty good. We had a D multiplied by four, I think, and we got reasonable performance and it was it was fast, so it's good. And that also applies to the index size as well. So low end bit size, index size isn't too bad. With higher end bits, it's pretty huge. So also something to think about. Now let's move on to HNSW. Now HNSW is, well the first part of it is NSW, which is Navigable Small World Graphs. Now what makes a graph small world, it essentially means that this graph can be very large, but the number of hops, so the number of steps you need to take between any two vertexes, which is a, the points, is very low. So in, in this example here, we have this vertex over here. And to get over to this one on the opposite side, we need to take one, two, three, four hops. And this is obviously a very small network, so it doesn't really count, but you can see this sort of behavior in very large networks. So I think in 2016, there was a study from Facebook. And at that point, I don't 
remember the exact number of people that they had on the platform, but it's, I think it's in the billions. And they found that the average number of hops that you need to take between any two people on the platform is like 3.6. So that's a very good example of a navigable small world graph. Now, hierarchical NSW graphs, which is what we are using, they're built in the same way, like a, a NSW graph, but then they're split across multiple layers, which is, is what you can see here. And when we are performing our search, the path it takes will, will hop between different layers in order to find our nearest neighbor. Now, it's pretty complicated, and this is really, I think, oversimplifying it a lot, but that's the, the general gist of it. I'm not going to go any further into it. We will, I think, in a future video and article. Now, let's put that together in code. So we have a few different variables here. We have M, which I'm going to set to, 50, to 16. And M is the number of connections that each vertex has. So of course, that means you know, greater connectivity. We're probably going to find our nearest neighbors more accurately. EF search, which is how, what is the depth of our search every time we, we perform a search. So we, we can set this to a higher value if we want to search more for the network or a low value if we want to search less for the network. Obviously, low value is going to be quicker. High value is going to be more accurate. And then we have EF construction. Now, this, similar to EF search, is how much of the network will we search but not during the actual search, during the construction of the network. So this is essentially how efficiently and accurately are we going to build the network in the first place. So this will increase the, the add time, but the search time it makes no difference on. So it's good to use a high number, I think, for this one. So initialize our index and we have it's a FICE index HNSW flat. So we can use different uh, vectors here. So we can, I think, PQ, PQ there. And essentially what that's going to do is, is make this search faster, but slightly less accurate. Now, this is already really fast with flats and that's all we're going to stick with. But again, like I said, we will uh, return to this at some point in the future and cover it in a lot more detail for sure. So dimension IT, we need to pass in our M value here as well. Now we want to apply those two parameters. So we have EF search, which is obviously EF search. And then we also have HNSW, the, obviously the EF construction. So that should be everything ready to go. And all we want to do now is add our data. So index.add wb. Okay. Now, like I said, we have that EF construction. We use a reasonably high value. So you can see this is already taking a lot longer than the previous indexes to actually add our vectors into it. But it's still not going to take that long. And then once it is done, we are going to do our search just like we did every other time. So we have di equals search, sorry, index.search. And we are going to pass in our query and also K. Okay, so 43.6 seconds to add the vectors there. So a fair bit longer, but then look at this super fast like that, 3.7 milliseconds. So much faster than the last one. I think the last one was 16 milliseconds, right? Okay, this is a flat index, 157, LSH, we have 17.6. Okay, so really quick, which is cool. 
but how's the how's the performance so let's have a look okay so we get quite a few falses here and only a couple of truths so okay it's not so great it was really fast but it's not very accurate but fortunately we can fix that so let's increase our EF search I'm going to increase it a fair bit let's go 32 32 and this is probably I would imagine more than enough uh, to get good performance so run this and run this okay and now we see we get pretty good results now the war time is higher so it's just a case of balancing it because this is now higher than LSH but what we can do is so increase EF construction time the value for EF construction increase these or decrease those depending on what you want so there's a lot of flexibility with this and it can be really fast this is HSW is essentially one of the best performing indexes that you can use if you look at the current state of the art a lot of them are HNSW or they're based on HNSW in, in some way or another. So these are good ones, good ones to, to go with. You just need to play around them a little bit. So this is a few of the sort of performance I found using the same data set, uh, but I'm messing around. So we have the EF construction values down here. So we start with 16 over here up to 64. Of EF search values over here and our M values over here. And we've got pretty good recall over 64 on the uh, EF construction. So EF construction is a really good one to just in increase because it doesn't increase your search time, which is, is pretty cool, I think. And then here is the, the search time again for HNSW, um, M and EF search. Obviously, I didn't include. EF construction there because it doesn't make a difference uh, and that's this is the one thing uh, with HSW the index size is absolutely huge so that's just one thing uh, to, to bear in mind the the index size can take a lot of memory uh, but otherwise really really cool index and then that leaves us on to our final index which is the IVF index and this is super popular and with good reasons, it is very good. So the inverted file index is based on essentially clustering uh, data points. So we see here we have all of these different data points, the, the little crosses. And then we have these three other points, which are going to be our cluster centroids. So around each or base in each of our plus centroids we expand a catchment radius around each of those and as you can see here where each of those circles collides it creates the edge of what are going to be our almost like catchment cells and this is called a, a Voronoi diagram or I'm try it's a really hard word Dirichlet tessellation I don't know if that's correct but it sounds I, I think it sounds pretty cool so I thought I'd throw that in there so we create these cells in each one of those cells um, any data point within those cells will be allocated to that given centroid and then when you search within a specific cell you, you, you pass your xq value in there and that will be compared the xq value will be compared to every single cluster centroid but not the other values within that cluster or the other clusters only the cluster centroids and then from that you find out which centroid is the closest to your query vector and then what we do is we restrict our search scope to only the data points within that cluster or that or that cell and then we um, and then we calculate the nearest vector so the, at this point we have all the vectors only within that cell and we, we compare all of those to our query vector now there is one problem with this which is called the edge problem now we're just showing this in two-dimensional space obviously in reality for example the, the data that we're using we have 128 dimensions so dimension it, the edge problem is kind of complicated when you think about it in the hundreds of dimensions but what this is is so with say with our query we we 
find that crew vector is right on the edge of one of the cells. And if we set our n probe value, so I mentioned n probe here, uh, that's how many cells we search. If that is set to one, it means that we're going to restrict our search to only that cell. Even though, if you if you look at this, we have two, or we have, I'm trying to think, so this one for sure is closer to our query vector than any of the magenta data points. And possibly also this one and this one, but, and maybe even this one. But we're not going to consider any of those because we're restricting our search only to this cell. So we're only going to look at you know these data points and also these over here. So th that's that's the edge problem. But we can get around that by not just searching one cell, but by searching quite a few. So in this case, our M probe value is eight, and that means we're going to search eight of the nearest centroids or, or centroid cells. And that's how IVF works. Let's go ahead and implement that in code. So first thing we need to do is set our n list value, which is the number of centroids uh, that we will have within our within our data. And then this time, so this is a little bit different. We need to set the the final vector search that we're going to do. So we're this is kind of split into two different operations, right? So we're searching based on clusters, and then we're actually comparing the full vectors within the selected clusters. So we need to define how we're going to do that final uh, that final search between our full vectors and our query vector. So what we do is we write FICE. So we do index flat. We're going to index flat IP. You can use L2 as well. We set our dimension IT. So we're just initializing a flat index there. And then what we're going to do is feed that into our IVF index. So our IVF index is FICE index IVF and flat because we're using the, the flat indexes, the flat vectors there. We need to pass our quantizer. So the, the this step here, the, the other step to the search process, the dimensionality and also our end list value. So how many cells or clusters we're going to have in there. And with this, because we're clustering data, we need to do uh, something else. So in fact, let me show you. So if we write index is trained, we get this false. If we wrote that for any of our other indexes, this would have been true because they don't need to be trained because we're not doing clustering or any other form of training or optimization there. So what we need to do is we need to train our index before we use it. So we write index train and we just pass all of our vectors into that. But it's very quick, so it's not really um, an, an issue. And then we do index add, pass our data, And then what we do, uh, one thing is I want to show you, we have our n probe value. We'll search with one for now. So we search one cell. And to search, we write di, as we have every other time, search, xq, k. Okay, so, I mean, it's super fast. 3.32 milliseconds. I think that's maybe the fastest, other than our bad performing uh, or, or low quality HNS sub U index. So let's see how, how that's performed. So we write mp.in1d baseline. Hi. You can see uh, it's not too bad to be fair, like 50 50 almost. So that's it's actually pretty good. But what we can do if we want it to be even better is we increase the emperor value. So let's go up to four. So that's increased the war time quite a bit. So from like three to 125, which is now super slow actually. Uh, but now we're getting perfect results. Uh, we can maybe decrease that to two. So now it's, it's faster. That could have been a one-off sometimes. Uh, occasionally you get a really slow search. It just happens sometimes. So this is, so we, set m probe to two, super fast and super accurate. So that, that's a very good index as well. So these are the 
stats I got in terms of recall and search time in, in milliseconds for different end probe values and different end list values. So again, so it's just about balancing it again. Index size, uh, the only thing that affects your index size here is obviously the size of your data and the end list value, but you can increase the end list value loads and the index size hardly increases. So this is like um, increasing by 100 kilobytes per like double of the end list value. So it's, it is very, it's like nothing. So that's it for this video. And we, we covered quite a lot. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, but I think these, all these indexes are super useful and, and quite interesting and, and figuring out, just playing around with them. Uh, like you see, I, I've done loads with these, with these graphs, just seeing what is faster, what is slower, what, where the good quality is. And just playing around the parameters and seeing what you can get out of it is super useful uh, for actually understanding these. Now, what I do want to do going forwards is actually explore each one of these indexes in more depth because we've only covered them like very, very, very high level at the moment. So in future videos, articles, we're going to go into more depth and explore them a lot more so that would be pretty interesting i think so that's it for this video thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next one